Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 496, That Nagging Cough. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I hope you are too. I'm apologizing right now for not having made it to a microphone last week. I, I think there was this thing that happened when I was teaching, which was Every time a semester ended, I would relax. We would have a vacation usually, whether it coincided with Christmas or in New York, we had a winter break or summer. I would get sick the day after (laughs) the day after the semester ended because it's that finally you can relax and you, you lower your defenses and your immune system relaxes too. And now you're sick. It was kind of that. It kind of continues to be that. I am constantly fighting a cold, but this time I think it's not so much because I've relaxed. It's because I'm working with people around me and all of a sudden I'm in contact with, I imagine, germs and things. So it's been a tricky couple of weeks and I still have a cough that I cannot get rid of. So that's kind of stinky. But last week I really did have a a much harder time breathing and speaking. So This week's much better, which means, hi, I'm here with you. So I have managed to do exactly nothing crafty beyond figuring out better ways to commute to work. That's been my most creative endeavor, that and figuring out how to do, you know, seven or eight things at once. So that's not a whole lot of interesting stuff to share. However, I did learn yesterday there is a knitter somewhere in the building who is also gluten-free. I don't know how this happens. Perhaps this is a thing now, but I have yet to meet her. I haven't gone and introduced myself, but I'm kind of excited about that. Somebody, somebody else there knits and she knits in meetings. Same thing that we know, the cognitive anchoring thing. This is evidently how she also remembers things better too. I love that. But one of the things that I have figured out how to do while I have been commuting is listen to the chapters. So this week, while I was driving back and forth, I listened to our next chapter, chapter 29, and heard some things that kind of surprised me like this. There's a line, a reference to the fact that no one has been married in the church. I find this very surprising. How is it that no one was married in the church ever yet? At this point in time, 1908, no one had been married in their church. It's because while the Anglican church required, at at a certain point in time, required that people get married in the actual church building, prior to that, that was not everybody else's custom. And we are looking at a Presbyterian culture here, and they got married at home. Lucy Maud Montgomery married at home. Everybody else married at home or on their grounds, outside, under the trees, that kind of thing. That was just expected and normal. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You'll hear Anne talk about an exhibition. She's talking about what I would think of as a state fair, someplace that is, it's in a big city or a big town, someplace kind of centralized to a lot of people around. It would be a place where you could show off your prized tomato or sheep or knitting and and give you an opportunity to compete with other people for prizes, blue ribbons and things for your work. And that's that's all it is. Annual, big, and well attended, especially by the community that, that Anne is part of. Uh, she will mention broadcloth, which is a, a very finely woven woolen cloth that she's talking about. 
And this is the chapter that has one of the best lines in the book. Oh, I wish I could remember who shared it. There's a, a Pinterest image of this line, which is, it's so much easier to be good if your clothes are fashionable. <laughs> and true, sort of, kind of, because you feel much more comfortable when you are wearing clothes that allow you to feel like you are comfortable and in the right place and happy. But I just love having it summed up in one sentence like that. Anne is going to mention brilliant restaurants. And she's not talking about brilliant colloquially, like, oh, that was brilliant of you. She's talking about brilliant. Wow, that's very bright and shiny. And the reason she's mentioning it that way is because in Charlottetown, they had electricity at this point in time. In fact, they got gas lighting in 1854. And then that was replaced by electric in 1884. Between 1884 and 1885, the place went to electric. And 10 years later, the gas company closed down. It couldn't compete anymore. But that doesn't mean that everybody had electricity. In fact, Lucy Maud Montgomery didn't have electricity in her home until they moved to a new place in 1926. Prior to that, she'd been living with gas lamps. Wow, that's a long time to live without electricity. I know that everybody did. It's just one of those things that I think about every so often and marvel at how different life would be if I didn't have electricity. So go Lucy Maud Montgomery. So there are only two words that jumped out at me as words that we don't usually hear coming out of the mouths of tweens and teenagers, young, young teenage girls. And those two words are prosaic and dissipated. <laughs> prosaic is of prose, not poetry. So something that is poetic is something that Anne would probably like. Something that is prosaic, that tends to be more prose, less poetry, probably not so much for Anne. And dissipated has two related meanings. Smoke could dissipate into the air. It could disappear kind of gradually and slowly. And people, situations, money could be dissipated, kind of frittered away or he really let himself go. He dissipated. That's a more kind of judgy use of the word, but I will leave it to you to decide how Anne is using it. And with that, let's listen to chapter 29 of Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read for us by Kim Zuckert. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 29, An Epic in Anne's Life. Anne was bringing the cows home from the back pasture by way of Lover's Lane. It was a September evening, and all the gaps and clearings in the woods were brimmed up with ruby sunset light. Here and there the lane was splashed with it, but for the most part it was already quite shadowy beneath the maples, and the spaces under the firs were filled with a clear violet dust like airy wine. The winds were out in their tops, and there is no sweeter music on earth than that which the wind makes in the fir trees at evening. The cows swung placidly down the lane, and Anne followed them dreamily, repeating aloud the battle canto from Marmion, which had also been part of their English course the preceding winter, and which Miss Stacy had made them learn off by heart, and exulting in its rushing lines and the clash of spears in its imagery. When she came to the lines, the stubborn spearsmen still made good their dark, impenetrable wood. She stopped in ecstasy to shut her eyes that she might the better fancy herself one of that heroic ring. When she opened it again, it was to behold Diana coming through the gate that led into the Barry Field, and looking so important that Anne instantly divined there was news to be told but betray too eager curiosity she would not. "'Isn't this evening just like a purple dream, Diana? It just makes me so glad to be alive. In the mornings I always think the mornings are best, but when evening comes I think it's lovelier still.' "'It's a very fine evening,' said Diana. "'But, oh, I have such news, Anne. Guess. You can have three guesses.' "'Charlotte Gillis is going to be married in the church after all, and Mrs. Allen wants us to decorate it,' cried Anne." 
No, Charlotte's beau won't agree to that, because nobody ever has been married in the church yet, and he thinks it would seem too much like a funeral. It's too mean, because it would be such fun. Guess again. Jane's mother is going to let her have a birthday party? Diana shook her head, her black eyes dancing with merriment. I can't think what it can be, said Anne in despair. Unless it's that Moody Spurgeon MacPherson saw you home from prayer meeting last night. Did he? I should think not, exclaimed Diana indignantly. I wouldn't be likely to boast of it if he did, the horrid creature. I knew you couldn't guess it. Mother had a letter from Aunt Josephine today, and Aunt Josephine wants you and me to go to town next Tuesday and stop with her for the exhibition. There! Oh, Diana! whispered Anne, finding it necessary to lean up against a maple tree for support. Do you really mean it? But I'm afraid Marilla won't let me go. She will say she can't encourage gadding about. That was what she said last week when Jane invited me to go with them in their double-seated buggy to the American concert in the White Sands Hotel. I wanted to go, but Marilla said I'd be better at home learning my lessons, and so would Jane. I was bitterly disappointed, Diana. I felt so heartbroken that I wouldn't say my prayers when I went to bed. But I repented of that and got up in the middle of the night and said them. "'I'll tell you,' said Diana. "'We'll get Mother to ask Marilla. "'She'll be more likely to let you go then, "'and if she does, we'll have the time of our lives, Anne. "'I've never been to an exhibition, "'and it's so aggravating to hear the other girls talking about their trips. "'Jane and Ruby have been twice, and they're going this year again.' "'I'm not going to think about it all until I know whether I can go or not,' "'said Anne resolutely. "'If I did and then was disappointed, it would be more than I could bear.' But in case I do go, I'm very glad my new coat will be ready by that time. Marilla didn't think I needed a new one. She said my old one would do very well for another winter, and that I ought to be satisfied with having a new dress. The dress is very pretty, Diana, navy blue and made so fashionably. Marilla always makes my dresses fashionably now, because she says she doesn't intend to have Matthew going to Mrs. Lynde to make them. I'm so glad. It's ever so much easier to be good if your clothes are fashionable. At least it's easier for me. I suppose it doesn't make such a difference to naturally good people, but Matthew said I must have a new coat, so Marilla bought a lovely piece of blue broadcloth, and it's being made by a real dressmaker over at Carmody. It's to be done Saturday night, and I'm trying not to imagine myself walking up the church aisle on Sunday in my new suit and cap, because I'm afraid it just isn't right to imagine such things. But it just slips into my mind in spite of me. My cap is so pretty. Matthew bought it for me the day we were over at Carmody. It's one of those little blue velvet ones that are all the rage with gold cord and tassels. Your new hat is elegant, Diana, and so becoming. When I saw you coming to church last Sunday, my heart swelled with pride to think you were my dearest friend. Do you suppose it's wrong for us to think so much about our clothes? Marilla says it's very sinful, but it's such an interesting subject, isn't it? Marilla agreed to let Anne go to town, and it was arranged that Mr. Barry should take the girls in on the following Tuesday. As Charlottetown was thirty miles away, and Mr. Barry wished to go and return the same day, it was necessary to make a very early start. But Anne counted it all joy, and was up before sunrise on Tuesday morning. A glance from her window assured her that the day would be fine, for the eastern sky behind the firs of the haunted wood was all silvery and cloudless. Through the gap in the trees, a light was shining in the western gable of Orchard Slope, a token that Diana was also up. Anne was dressed by the time Matthew had the fire on, and had the breakfast ready when Marilla came down, but for her own part was much too excited to eat. After breakfast, the jaunty new cap and jacket were donned, and Anne hastened over the brook and up through the firs to Orchard Slope. Mr. Barry and Diana were waiting for her, and they were soon on the road. It was a long drive, but Anne and Diana enjoyed every minute of it. It was delightful to rattle along over the moist roads in the early red sunlight that was creeping across the shorn harvest fields. The air was fresh and crisp, and little smoke-blue mists curled through the valleys and floated off from the hills. Sometimes the road went through woods where maples were beginning to hang out scarlet banners, Sometimes it crossed rivers on bridges that made Anne's flesh cringe with the old half-delightful fear. Sometimes it wound along a harbor shore and passed by a little cluster of weather-gray fishing huts. Again it mounted to hills whence a far sweep of curving upland or misty blue sky could be seen. But wherever it went there was much of interest to discuss. It was almost noon when they reached town and found their way to Beechwood. 
It was quite a fine old mansion, set back from the streets in a seclusion of green elms and branching beeches. Miss Barry met them at the door with a twinkle in her sharp black eyes. "'So you've come to see me at last, you Anne girl,' she said. "'Mercy, child, how you've grown. You're taller than I am, I declare. And you're ever so much better looking than you used to be, too. But I dare say you know that without being told.' "'Indeed I didn't,' said Anne radiantly. "'I know I'm not so freckled as I used to be, so I've much to be thankful for, "'but I really hadn't dared to hope there was any other improvement. Oh, "'I'm so glad you think there is, Miss Barry.' "'Miss Barry's house was furnished with great magnificence,' as Anne told Marilla afterwards. "'The two little country girls were rather abashed by the splendor of the parlor "'where Miss Barry left them when she went to see about dinner. "'Isn't this just like a palace?' whispered Diana. I never was in Aunt Josephine's house before, and I had no idea it was so grand. I just wish Julia Bell could see this. She puts on such airs about her mother's parlor. Velvet carpet, sighed Anne luxuriously, and silk curtains. I've dreamed of such things, Diana. But you know, I don't believe I feel very comfortable with them after all. There's so many things in this room, and it's so splendid that there's no scope for imagination. That is one consolation when you're poor. There are so many more things you can imagine about. Their sojourn in town was something that Anne and Diana dated from for years. From first to last, it was crowded with delights. On Wednesday, Miss Barry took them to the exhibition grounds and kept them there all day. It was splendid, Anne related to Marilla later on. I never imagined anything so interesting. I don't really know which department was the most interesting. I think I like the horses and the flowers and the fancy work best. Josie Pye took first prize for knitted lace. I was real glad she did, and I was glad that I felt glad for it shows I'm improving, don't you think, Marilla, when I can rejoice in Josie's success? Mr. Harmon Andrews took second prize for gravestine apples, and Mr. Bell took first prize for a pig. Diana said she thought it was ridiculous for a Sunday school superintendent to take a prize in pigs, but I don't see why. Do you? She said she would always think of it after this when he was praying so solemnly. Clara Louise McPherson took a prize for painting, and Mrs. Lynde got first prize for homemade butter and cheese, so Avonlea was pretty well represented, wasn't it? Mrs. Lynde was there that day, and I never knew how much I really liked her until I saw her familiar face among all those strangers. There were thousands of people there, Marilla. Made me feel dreadfully insignificant. "'and Mrs. Barry took us up to the grandstand to see the horse races. "'Mrs. Lynde wouldn't go. "'She said horse racing was an abomination, "'and she, being a church member, thought it her bounden duty "'to set a good example by staying away. "'But there were so many there, "'I don't believe Mrs. Lynde's absence would ever be noticed. "'I don't think, though, that I ought to go very often to horse races, "'because they are awfully fascinating. "'Diana got so excited that she offered to bet me ten cents "'that the red horse would win.' I didn't believe he would, but I refused to bet, because I wanted to tell Mrs. Allen all about everything, and I felt sure it wouldn't do to tell her that. It's always wrong to do anything you can't tell the minister's wife. It's as good as an extra conscience to have a minister's wife for your friend. And I was very glad I didn't bet, because the red horse did win, and I would have lost ten cents. So you see that virtue was its own reward. We saw a man go up in a balloon. I'd love to go up in a balloon, Marilla. It would be simply thrilling. And we saw a man selling fortunes. You paid him ten cents, and a little bird picked out your fortune for you. Miss Barry gave Diana and me ten cents each to have our fortunes told. Mine was that I would marry a dark-complected man who was very wealthy, and I would go across water to live. I looked very carefully at all the dark men I saw after that, but I didn't care much for any of them, and anyhow I suppose it's too early to be looking out for him yet. Oh, it was a never-to-be-forgotten day, Marilla. I was so tired I couldn't sleep at night. Miss Barry put us in the spare room, according to promise. It was an elegant room, Marilla. But somehow sleeping in a spare room isn't what I used to think it was. That's the worst of growing up, and I'm beginning to realize it. The things you wanted so much when you were a child don't see half so wonderful to you when you get them. Thursday, the girls had a drive in the park, and in the evening, Miss Barry took them to a concert in the Academy of Music, where a noted prima donna was to sing. To Anne, the evening was a glittering vision of delight. Oh, Marilla, it was beyond description. I was so excited I couldn't even talk. So you may know what it was like. I just sat in enraptured silence. Madame Selitsky was perfectly beautiful and wore white satin and diamonds. But when she began to sing... 
I never thought about anything else. Oh, I can't tell you how I felt, but it seemed to me that it could never be hard to be good any more. I felt like I do when I look up to the stars. Tears came into my eyes, but oh, they were such happy tears. I was so sorry when it was all over, and I told Miss Barry I didn't see how I w was ever to return to common life again. She said she thought if we went over to the restaurant across the street and had some ice cream it might help me. That sounded so prosaic, but to my surprise I found it true. The ice cream was delicious, Marilla, and it was so lovely and dissipated to be sitting there eating it at eleven o'clock at night. Diana said she believed she was born for city life. Miss Barry asked me what my opinion was, but I said I would have to think it over very seriously before I could tell her what I really thought. So I thought it over after I went to bed. That is the best time to think things out. And I came to the conclusion, Marilla, that I wasn't born for city life, and that I was glad of it. It's nice to be eating ice cream at brilliant restaurants at eleven o'clock at night once in a while, but as a regular thing, I'd rather be in the East Gable at eleven, sound asleep, but kind of knowing even in my sleep that the stars were shining outside and that the wind was blowing in the firs across the brook. I told Miss Barry so at breakfast the next morning, and she laughed. Miss Barry generally laughed at anything I said, even when I said the most solemn things. I don't think I liked it, Marilla, because I wasn't trying to be funny, but she is a most hospitable lady and treated us royally. Friday brought going home time, and Mr. Barry drove in for the girls. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourself, said Miss Barry, as she bade them goodbye. Indeed we have, said Diana. "'And you, Anne, girl?' "'I've enjoyed every minute of the time,' said Anne, "'throwing her arms impulsively about the old woman's neck "'and kissing her wrinkled cheek. "'Diana would never have dared to do such a thing "'and felt rather aghast at Anne's freedom. "'But Miss Barry was pleased, "'and she stood on her veranda and watched the buggy out of sight. "'Then she went back into her big house with a sigh. "'It seemed very lonely, lacking those fresh young lives.' Miss Barry was a rather selfish old lady, if the truth must be told, and had never cared much for anybody but herself. She valued people only as they were of service to her or amused her. Anne had amused her, and consequently stood high in the old lady's good graces. But Miss Barry found herself thinking less about Anne's quaint speeches than of her fresh enthusiasms, her transparent emotions, her little winning ways, and the sweetness of her eyes and lips. "'I thought Marilla Cuthbert was an old fool "'when I heard she'd adopted a girl out of an orphan asylum,' "'she said to herself. "'But I guess she didn't make much of a mistake after all. "'If I'd had a child like Anne in the house all the time, "'I'd be a better and happier woman.' "'Anne and Diana found the drive home as pleasant as the drive in. "'Pleasanter, indeed, "'since there was the delightful consciousness of home waiting at the end of it. "'It was sunset when they passed through White Sands,' and turned into the shore road. Beyond, the Avonlea hills came out darkly against the saffron sky. Behind them, the moon was rising out of the sea that grew all radiant and transfigured in her light. Every little cove along the curving road was a marvel of dancing ripples. The waves broke with a soft swish on the rocks below them, and the tang of the sea was in the strong, fresh air. "'Oh, but it's good to be alive and to be going home,' breathed Anne. When she crossed the log bridge over the brook, the kitchen light of green gables winked her a friendly welcome back, and through the open door shone the hearth fire, sending out its warm red glow athwart the chilly autumn night. Anne ran blithely up the hill and into the kitchen, where a hot supper was waiting on the table. "'So you've got back.' said Marilla, folding up her knitting. "'Yes, oh, and it's so good to be back,' said Anne joyously. "'I could kiss everything, even to the clock. "'Marilla, a broiled chicken? "'You don't mean to say you cooked that for me?' "'Yes, I did,' said Marilla. "'I thought you'd be hungry after such a drive "'and need something real appetizing. "'Hurry and take off your things, "'and we'll have supper as soon as Matthew comes in. "'I'm glad you got back, I must say.' It's been fearful lonesome here without you, and I never put in four longer days. After supper, Anne sat before the fire between Marilla and Matthew and gave them a full account of her visit. I've had a splendid time, she concluded happily, and I feel that it marks an epoch in my life. 
But the best of it all was the coming home. End of chapter 29. Nice ending to a chapter, isn't it? I thought this was one of those big turning point chapters where Marilla has clearly changed. She has been so affected over time by Anne and Anne's presence. But Anne also learned some important things about herself as well, which is really lovely. And I, I actually thought there were a lot of really wisely put thoughts that, that Lucy Maud Montgomery must have been in one of those moods where she was just channeling wisdom because there's the, the it's easier to be good if your clothes are fashionable one. But there was also uh, when they were at Miss Berry's, too many nice things leave so little room for your imagination. There's, there's no way to have any scope of imagination, as Anne loves to say. That's a really interesting way to put it and makes perfect sense to me. I thought that was pretty cool. I also thought never do anything you couldn't tell the minister's wife is probably really good advice, <laughs> especially in the age of social media. If the minister's wife were watching you type on your screen, would you continue to say that and hit enter? If not, perhaps think twice about whether you should do it or not. I think my mom had said, don't write anything down that you don't want other people to read. And we were talking about passing notes at school. And obviously that stuck with me too, that that's, that's a good way to think about it. If you don't want the teacher to read it out loud in class, don't write it down <laughs> and hand it to somebody because it's going to get taken away. So words to live by. I also loved that Anne was told that she was going to marry what, a dark, a dark, handsome man. And so she kept her eye out on all of the dark, handsome men that she was looking at <laughs> at the exhibition, but she didn't much care for any of them. We know who the fortune teller's talking about. Anne refuses to listen to that particular fortune, but I really loved the idea of, you know, keeping your eye out just in case while you're at the exhibition, in case the guy you're going to marry just pops up. I also thought it was fantastic that Anne finally gets to sleep in the spare room, which is lovely, but not as good as home. And not only not as good as home, but her line, that's the worst of growing up. And I'm beginning to realize it. The things you wanted so much when you were a child don't seem half so wonderful to you when you get them. And I think that's been true for me anyway, when I think about things, when it's people or home, capital H, that I think has turned out to be exactly right for me. There is something really lovely about having your family, especially if you are lucky enough to have a family that understands you, a family that, that you are understood by and that you understand, that can be a very, very comforting, regular thing. And if you haven't been in that situation, but you have built a family of your own out of the people who understand you and who you understand, that level of comfort of having a place where you can go and people you can be with is huge. And I think always as wonderful as you hoped it would be when you get back to them. But things, the things that you wanted so badly that you get at Christmas time and you open it and you play with it and then you're done. And then you wind up going back and hanging out with people. Anne is wise, which means Lucy Maud Montgomery is wise. And Anne clearly loves her home and the people in it, but the place too. And the place mattered to Lucy Maud Montgomery as well. So yay. This last weekend, we were able to visit friends who I've mentioned before down in Virginia. We drove down to see their sons who are in between thing one and thing two's ages. So they just stair step down kind of perfectly. Uh, we went to see their sons in Beauty and the Beast. So thing two was in Beauty and the Beast this summer here at his summer camp. Last week, last year, he was Captain Hook. This year, he was Lumiere. And I think I posted a couple of pictures on Facebook and Twitter. And I don't know if I made it to Instagram. I have to go look. He was adorable as Lumiere. But it was so much fun to go down and see our friends' kids do the same show. They did a slightly different version of it. And their youngest son 
was LeFou. He is still a, a small, diminutive kid with a beautiful voice and 100% commitment at being a clown. He was so much fun to watch. Their older boy hadn't been in shows before. He was you know, one of the dancers and in the crowd and singing and taking it very seriously. It was so much fun to get to see them. But what was also really fun was that my friend has been listening to Anne of Green Gables. And she was Anne of Green Gables when she was in, I think, grad school, I think she said, and had won an award for playing it. And boy, does she love Kim Zuckert. So that's kind of cool. I've had a lot of fun texting back and forth with Kim as we've been working through the book. And it's, again, like with all craftlet people who I have met out in the world or in Scotland or wherever, it's kind of like the coming home thing, like talking to people who love these books. It's a safe place. And the people I've met through this podcast are just wonderful people. I got to go briefly uh, two evenings. I was able to go to Podcast Movement, which is this ginormous, and I'm talking 2,000 podcasters showing up in Philadelphia. It's this ginormous event with seminars and meetups and a monetary track and an NPR track. And all these people were there. And because I got the job job, I wasn't able to go. So I drove down after work and tried to meet the friends who I never get to see. And I, I did. I got to see some really great people. One of them, though, was Clay, who does the Fish Nerds podcast, who I met last year at the much smaller and honestly a lot more comfortable MapCon, the Mid-Atlantic Podcasters Convention. Clay had competed in a, a podcast challenge where I think they had six minutes to do a condensed version of their entire show. And a bunch of people did this, including, I think, some NPR people. And Clay won. And he has like a world welterweight champion style belt. <laughs> I took a picture of him in it. I will post it. If I, if I haven't already posted it, I'll put it in the Craftlet group on, on Facebook and Twitter. I think I put it up on Instagram. But it was hilarious. And it was so much fun to see him because here you are in a building full of thousands of podcasters most of whom I don't know by sight. If they spoke, I would recognize them, but I don't know what they look like. But him, I knew him. And we both gravitated and said, oh, it's so good to see you. So we got a chance to talk and catch up. If you want to go fishing, he is now a registered licensed fishing guide. He's very good with families and children, which is not true of all fishing guides. If you are interested, check out Fish Nerds podcast. You can find it everywhere you expect to find podcasts and then follow him. And he works in New Hampshire and takes people fishing. He had hilarious stories of going fishing with people. And one of the things that he does, which I thought was adorable, is if he's fishing with a family, especially with smaller children who are happy to fish, but they don't really want to touch the fish. When they catch something, he will crouch behind them and stick his hands under their arms, and they put their hands behind their back. So it's his hands in the picture holding their fish, and it's their face and body. So they don't have to touch the fish, but they get a picture of them, in air quotes, holding their catch for posterity. So it's adorable. He's a lot of fun. But the other person I got to meet, finally, in person, was Daniel. Daniel J. Lewis from the Once Upon a Time podcast. We'd been talking and Skyping with each, with each other for a year and never had an opportunity to be in the same place at the same time. And Clay and I decided to try going over to this huge party that was held at the Philly Marketplace downtown. It's kind of like Pike Place Market, but underneath buildings. And I don't know, I, I couldn't get a really good look at it. It was my first time going in there because it was pouring down buckets of rain. So we bolted across the street. We got in soaking wet. It was warm. We dried off soon. But it, in this enormous, very loud venue, we actually ran into Daniel, one of the people that I'd hoped to find and be able to say hi to. So that was really neat and so gratifying, I guess, to have been working with him and find out that in person he is exactly as wonderful 
and a lot of fun, just as he was on his podcast. So that was pretty awesome too. And I, I think that catches you up on everything, except within the next two weeks, we take thing one off to college. And he's 18 now, and he went to Scotland with us. So he is also now Aaron, which he hasn't been for a long time. In the beginning, I called my kids by their names. And, you know, I was thinking like I was talking to 15 people. And suddenly the numbers spiked, and I had to come to terms with the fact that there were a lot of strangers listening who I probably should be careful back in 2006 of not saying my kids' names out loud when they're not adult people. So now Aaron is an adult person, and he is known as Thing One and becoming known as himself, Aaron. And college is coming. Holy smoke. And Thing Two is going to high school. So big stuff, exciting stuff, a little bit scary stuff, but uh, I hope to get some more pictures out to you from that. On that note, Take care. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>